Hi guys and welcome to today's class. Today we are looking at uh, the introduction to probability, which is the second part of this unit. As I mentioned earlier, the first part of the unit was covering descriptive statistics, where we looked at uh, the various ways of summarizing data, either using tables, using graphs, or obtaining numerical summaries in the name of uh, measures of central tendency, measures of dispersion, measures of skewness, uh, uh, measures of kurtosis, and so on and so forth. So the second part of this unit is an uh, introduction to probability. And uh, as you will notice, uh, the starting point of this uh, topic will be a review of some basic terms. And most of the terms that we're going to review here will be borrowed a lot from uh, set theory. Set theory is a concept that you learn in mathematics one. So let's go through some of the basic terminologies before we define probability and later on see the various ways of uh, calculating probabilities. So the first term that we are going to define is what we call a set. And we say that a set is a collection of some related objects or individuals or individuals. That's what we call a set. Then we say that the elements of a set, the elements of a set, or the individual, sorry, the individuals or objects found in a set are called elements. They are called elements. They are called elements of that set. They are called elements or members of the set. For example, we can define a set like, like this. Eh? So let's define a set like this. For example, this is the name of our set, days of the week. So we can define, we can denote the set like this, uh, capital D. Usually sets are denoted by capital letters. So we can denote it like this. Then these are the elements or members of that set. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and finally we have Sunday. So that's a set. Those are the days of the week. Huh? So that's a set containing days of the week. Okay. Then we can just note this. Huh? So additionally, we are saying that uh, sets are denoted by uh, capital letters, but the elements of the set are denoted using small letters. For example, you may have something like this. You may not a set like this, e.g. You can have a set like this, a is equal to That is a set. It's a set of vowels. Right? If you are required to explain or to describe your set, it's a set of vowels. Set of vowels in the English alphabet. Okay. Then we can say that uh, from this example, we can say that We can say that uh, U is an element of set A. U is an element of set A. Okay. 
which is denoted as, if you want to say that, you, you write this, huh? you like this is an element of S. So that's how, what, how you read or you denote uh, an element of a given set. So that is read as U is an element of set A. So that's the first concept, the concept of sets. The second concept that we need to define is what you call an experiment. An experiment. So when you talk about an experiment is an operation whose outcome cannot be predicted in advance with certainty. For instance, when you toss a coin, let's say three times, you can predict the possible outcomes, but you can never be sure of what exactly will happen until you are done with it, uh, until you, you perform the experiment. So you cannot predict in advance what will happen and, and you do that prediction with a lot of certainty. Okay. The third term that we need to define is what we call sample space. Sample space. And when we talk about a sample space, uh, this refers to the set of all the possible outcomes when you conduct an experiment. So the sample space is usually denoted by capital letter S. And we're saying that is a set of all the possible outcomes in an experiment. This definition here is analogous to what we call a, uni a universal set. So let's recall the definition of what we call a universal set. The universal set is actually what we are here in this context calling uh, the sample space. For example, so for example, in an experiment of rolling a die once, the sample space is defined as, so you can say S is equal to, usually the elements of a set are enclosed in brackets and separated by commas. So when you roll a die, you can either get a one, a two. So we need to write a list of all the possible outcomes. When you roll a die once. So that's what we call uh, a sample space. That's an example of a sample space. If, so let's say in an experiment of tossing a coin twice, or in an experiment of tossing two coins, the sample space will look like this. If you are tossing uh, two coins, then you can get head in the first co in the first coin, head in the second one, or head in the first one, tail in the other one, or tail in the first one, head in the in the second one, or you can get tail in both like that. So that's the sample space. Okay. So if you are tossing, let's say, a coin once, then the sample space will have only two elements. That is H uh, and T. Okay. The next definition is what we call an event. When we talk about an event, we refer to any subset of the sample space. That's basically what we call uh, an event. I, I know you are aware of the concept of subsets. Huh? So those subsets are what we are calling events here in the context of uh, in the context of probabilities. So as mentioned uh, earlier, we're saying that an event is any subset of the sample space S. And we can say that if A, capital A, is a subset of S, which is denoted like this, huh? denoted as you say A, then this is the symbol for subset, this one, huh? the symbol for subset. Huh? So that is read as A is a subset of S. Then this means that every element of A uh, is found in S or belongs to S. Belongs to S. So every element of A is found in S. That's what we call a subset. For example, let's have an, an illustration. So we, the example we're saying that consider the set D, which is defined above. This is the set containing days of the week, this set here. So if we consider that set, and then we define another set B, which contains the elements Tuesday, 
and Thursday, then we can say that B is a subset of D. As you notice, the, the, the symbol for subset here might be thought of as a, as a less than, huh? may be thought of as a less than. So that means that the set B is found in the set D, is found in the set D, okay? So let's have another illustration. In the example of rolling the die once, which is given below. So if we consider the, the example of rolling a die once where the universal, where the, the sample space is denoted by this, and then we define A as the set of all even numbers in S, all even numbers in this set, then we can claim that A is a subset of S where of course A is given by, it has elements two, four, and six. So that's the concept of uh, an event or a subset, huh? an event, which is clearly a subset, okay? Then uh, definition number five is what we call an empty or null set, an empty or the null set. So next we're defining the empty or the null set. And we're saying that this is simply a set which has no elements, okay? This is usually denoted by, we use the Greek letter phi. We use the Greek letter phi to denote an empty set. So thus, we're saying that the set phi is a set which has no elements, looks like that. So that's why we denote an empty set. So as you can see, we have not listed anything inside the brackets. So that's an empty set or a null set. Number six, definition of terms is what we call complement of a set. So when we talk about the complement of a set A, is a set which is denoted by A with uh, this flash of prime, A primer. We just read this as A complement. So this set, A complement, contains elements which are found in the sample space. But those elements are not in set A. They are not in set A, where A is a subset of, where A is a subset of S. Example, if we define S, if we define S as this, We define that as our S. This is our sample space. This is our sample space. Then we let A be the set of all even numbers in S. So two. This is set of all even numbers in S. Then the complement of set A is a set which contains elements which are found here, but they are not found here. And those elements are one, three, and five. So that's what we call the complement of set A, okay? Then it is good for you to note that if you take A plus the complement of A, you will get S. If you take A plus the complement of A, you will get the sample space or the universal set in this case. Okay. So next, I want us to look at a, a review of some basic set operations. When we talk about operations in, uh, let's say mathematics, we talk about the, the plus, the addition operation, the subtraction, the division, the multiplication. But in the context of sets, the only uh, operations that are valid is the addition. Like when you bring two sets together, which will be calling a union of a set, or when you take away some elements from a given set. Like what has happened here, a complement here might be thought of like, if you take S, you take away set A. What remains is the complement of that. 
So the basic operations that we shall be discussing here are what we call the union of two sets or even more and uh, what we call the intersection, set intersections. So when we talk about the union of a set, which we are saying uh, that is denoted by this symbol, which is a cup, C-U-P. Yeah? So the union of two sets, A and B, denoted by this, uh, is a set that contains elements that are either found in A or in B or in both sets. That's what we call the union of set. For example, we can let A be this set and then we let B to be equal to this. Then so we're talking about elements that are found either in this set or in this set or found in both. That's what you call the union. Okay. So we can say that then A union B is equal to the elements that are found in either in the first set or in the second set or in both sets are these one, two, and three. So those are elements that are found either in A or in B or in both. Usually in sets, every element appears in the set just once. So you can't have a one and another one in the same set. So every element appears just once in the set. Okay, so that's what we call the union of uh, two sets. So this one can be extended to more than two sets. So you can have A, union B, union C, and so on and so forth. So the next operation is what you're calling the intersection of sets, which is denoted by a cup like this one. And we're saying that the intersection of two sets A and B, which is denoted using this symbol here, is the set that comprises of elements that are found in both sets. For example, back to our example above, e.g. if you let set A comprise of these two elements, and then you let set B comprise of the elements one and three. Then A intersection B, that is a set that comprises of elements that are found in both sets, is a set that contains only one element. A set that contains only one element is the intersection as far as this is, of, is concerned. Okay, so it can happen that uh, there are no elements in the intersection. It can happen like that. So if that happens, then you say that uh, the intersection in that case will be an empty set. And if the intersection is an empty set, we say that the two sets are mutually exclusive. That is, they do not have any common elements. So just like we've said, uh, if there are no common elements between two sets, we say that the sets are mutually, mutually exclusive. For example, if you look at these two sets, A and B, then you can say these. Huh? Then if you take A in the section B, is an empty set. That means there are no elements. That means there are no elements. There are no common elements between the two sets or between the two events. So this is what implies that A and B are mutually exclusive. They are mutually exclusive events. Mutually exclusive events or, or sets. Okay. So let's look at this example where we're told to write down the intersection and the union of these two sets. Okay. So you can try that after after class. So next I want us to review the concept of Venn diagrams. And uh, I'll just uh, discuss the basic things about Venn diagrams because these are things that you covered in mathematics one. So I'll give maybe one example then we, so that we can move on to other things. So under Venn diagrams, I want us to try the following examples where you're told to draw a Venn diagram for each of the following sample spaces. So this is the information for the first 
sample space, oh, and this is the second problem. So uh, from the first problem, usually when you want to use Venn diagrams, you use a rectangle to represent the entire sample space. The entire sample space, which is equivalent to the universal set, is denoted by a rectangle. So this is our S. So all the six elements here, they are found within that rectangle. So subsets or events in this case are usually represented by circles or oval shapes. So here we have two circles. They can be circles or ovals, but the first one is our set A and the other one is set B. So to start with, you check if there are any common elements and if there are any common elements, you write them here. Those are the common elements. So the part that I've just shaded is the intersection of set A and set B. So looking at the information given, this information, this is set A and this is set B. So there's only one common element, one. One is the common element. So that's what you write here. One is found there. It's common between the two. Then uh, if you look at A, A does not have any other elements except this one. So the circle or the set A, this set here, A here, comprises of that element only. That circle here represents the set A, this circle here. Then going to the set B or this other circle here contains the element one, which is already there. And it also contains other elements, two and three, two and three. So that's why you write two and three. So those three elements, one, two, and three are the elements that are found in the union of A and B. So the other elements which are not found in the union of A and B, they are written outside the circles. So the other remaining elements yeah, from the sample space, you write them outside the circle. So you can have, uh, so we have, so we can have a four, we can have a five and a six like that. So that's a representation of the first case using a Venn diagram. When you have two, uh, when you have two subsets, it is fairly simple for you to complete the Venn diagram. In the second scenario, we still have our rectangle here, which is our S, but now we have three subsets. We have three subsets. So we have three circles inside here. And usually you try and make sure that all the circles are overlapping. You make sure all the circles are overlapping like that, okay? So here there are various scenarios. If you are here, uh, let me label the uh, Let me label the sets. So this is our, set A, our set B, and our set C. So if you are here, you are talking about elements that are found in A and B only. They are found in both A and B, or they are found in A and B, but they are not found in C. They are only found in those two sets. Here, when you are here, you're talking about elements that are found in A, B, and C. That is an intersection of all the three sets. If you are here, you're talking about uh, elements that are found in A and C, but they are not found in set B. If you are here, you're talking about elements that are found in B and C, but they are not found in element A. So let's try and figure out the answers here. So elements that are found in set A and B, those two sets only, set A and B, which elements are those? So here is the complete diagram where you notice that uh, here, there are no elements that are only common between A and B. So that's an empty set. Same case here. There are no elements which are found in C only. Then only this element one is found in A only. It's the only element which is found in B only. And then seven is found in all the three sets, in all the three sets, eight and nine, uh, are elements that are found in B and C, but not in A. The same case here, four is found in A and C, but not in B. So this is a complete picture. So elements two, five, and six can be said to be the complement of the union. So if you talk about the union of, if you talk about the union of A, the union of those three sets are the elements that are found within the circle. So you can say, one, three, four, seven, eight, nine. 
and then the complement of this, the complement of that, which uh, that is elements that are not found in the union, is uh, two, five, and six. Okay. Then if you talk about A intersection B intersection C, uh, that is only seven. Okay. If you talk about A intersection B intersection complement of B, uh, but not in B, but not in B, uh, that is only four and so on and so forth. Okay. So that's uh, how you can use Venn diagrams to solve some, some problems. So I think now uh, that is all about the review of uh, basic terminology. Let's now move to the definition of the term probability. The definition of the term probability. So we're saying that a probability is a numerical way of describing how or not an event is to happen. When you say that if every element in the sample space, if every element in the sample space is equally likely meaning that has equal chance of occurring, if that is the case, then we can define probability of an event A as follows. Of an event A, Follows. So we define the probability of an event A has the number of elements in the event A, where we know that event A is a subset of the universal set S, uh, divided by the number of elements in the, in the sample space. Please notice that that formula is only valid if every element in the sample space is equally likely or has equal chance of being selected. Okay, so let's have an example. So if we consider the, uh, the experiment of rolling a fair die once, whose sample space is given by these, uh, then if we define an event A as drawing an even number, the event of drawing an even number, and we can define our, then we can define, uh, or we can say that is, we let A to be equal to this, so A has the elements two, four, and six. Huh? Those are the possible even numbers when you roll a die. And remember we said that this is a, a fair die, meaning that all the sides, all the six sides are equally likely, or they have equal chance of appearing. So if this is so, then the probability of drawing an even number is given by probability of A, where A is the event of drawing an even number, which is equal to the number of elements in set A divided by number of elements in set S. And you just need to do simple counting. Eh? Here there are three elements. Eh? There are three elements, so this is three. And in set S, there are six elements. So the answer is one over two. So after defining the concept of probability and the focus, uh, the definition that we are focusing on is what we are calling the, uh, this, this definition here, which is called the classical definition of probability. So next I want us to look at what we call the axioms of probability. And when we talk about axioms, these are rules or laws which are generally accepted concerning probability. So these are rules which you don't need to be proved. So these are beliefs about probability uh, that we need to notice. And they are, we are going to list three of them, three axioms of probability, uh, where the first one says that, uh, so the three axioms of probability are as follows. The first one is that uh, the probability of S is equal to one, where S is the sample space. 
This simply means that the probability of observing an element in the sample space is a sure event, is something that you are guaranteed will happen, okay? Uh, for example, if, if you toss a fair coin once, if you toss a fair coin once, then you are sure that you will either get a head or a tail. One of them must occur, okay? And an event that must occur, that's what you're calling a sure event. So it's an event whose probability of occurrence is equal to one. The same case, if you roll a die, if you roll a, a die once, then uh, you are sure of getting either a one or a two or a three or a four or a five or a six. So that's the first axiom of probability, okay? So an axiom is a rule that we don't need to prove. So that's a, something that we don't need to prove. The second axiom is that the probability of an event A is always greater or equal to zero for all A, which are subsets of S. That is for all events A, which are found in the sample space. So this simply means that the probability of occurrence of any event which is found in the sample space is always non-negative. So probability does not take negative values. That's what we're saying. It can be zero or above, but it cannot take negative values. If it happens that the probability of a given event is equal to zero, because we're saying it can be zero or greater, if it happens that the event has a probability of occurrence of zero, we say that that is an impossible event. The probability of occurrence of an impossible event is equal to zero, okay? So then we continue to say that impossible events arise from what we call empty sets. They arise from what we call empty sets or events which have no elements. For example, if we consider the experiment of rolling a die once where this is a sample space, and then you define your event A as the event of rolling a seven. We know that a die has six sides. Eh? So if we consider A as the event of rolling a seven, then you notice that A is an empty set. A does not have any elements from the sample space. So if you were to use the classical definition of probability, that probability of A is equal to the number of elements in set A divided by the number of elements in set S will end up with zero because here there are no elements here be zero out of six, so the probability will be equal to zero. So when you have an empty set, then the probability of that uh, will always be equal to zero. So this also implies that if you take the probability of A, sorry, because we know that, uh, let me say this, uh, uh, we've said that A is an empty set like that. So if you are to do this, and then you also do this, you would say that this is equal to that. The probability of A, which is the same as the probability of phi, where phi represents an empty set, is always equal to, is equal to zero. <clears throat> and the third axiom is the one of unions. Probability of A union B is given by probability of A plus probability of B. If there are no common elements, if the intersection of the two sets is an empty set, then this is a definition of a union. You just take the probability of the first set plus the probability of the second one. So in many words, we're saying that the probability of getting an A or a B, that's what you call a union, is equal to probability of getting an A plus probability of getting a B if there are no common elements to set A and B. If there are no common elements to set A and B, okay? Then we say, uh, let's have an LB. We say that this formula This formula uh, relates to mutually exclusive events. That is when there are no common elements. So I want us to use a diagram to illustrate that, huh? to illustrate that concept. So let's consider, uh, let's consider this universal set or the sample space S and two subsets inside there where we have A and B. Clearly, you notice that set A and B are mutually exclusive. That means they have no common elements. So when we talk about the union of A and B, 
We're talking about the shaded part. So the shaded part is what we are calling A union B. Okay. So if you wanted to find the probability of the shaded part, clearly it would be an addition of the two individual areas. So that's where the third axiom is coming from. So here we're saying that uh, A and B are mutually exclusive. They have no common elements, as you can see. So let's have an, an example to illustrate that further. So let's consider the experiment of rolling a die. And then we define set A as a set containing the elements one and four, and set B as, an, as, an, as a set containing the elements two, three, and five. Then clearly, well, it is easy to see that sets A and B are mutually exclusive, where the probability of getting an A is the number of elements that are found in A, which is two, out of the number of elements in the sample space, which is six. And also the probability of getting a B is three out of six. You note that in this case, you note that, that A in the section B has no elements, is an empty set like that, it's an empty set. And you find that if you take A union B, if you are to mix the two groups, huh? if you are to mix, if you are to bring together A and B, then you will end up with this set. You will end up with this set. Huh? One, two, three, four, and five. So those are the elements of the union. Meaning that if you are to find the probability of A union B, you just count the number of elements in the union, which is five out of six. The number of elements in the union is equal to five out of six. And this five out of six is the same as probability of A plus probability of B, which is two out of six plus three out of six. So that's basically uh, the idea that we are bringing here. So let's consider the above experiment of rolling uh, a die once. Then you define your event A as the event of rolling an even number and then B as the event of rolling a prime number greater than two. Then you find these three. You find for a bit of A, for a bit of B, and for a bit of C. And for a bit of A union B, sorry. So let's look at the additional rule of probability, uh, the addition rule of probability. And we're saying that the third axiom that we've just discussed is a special case of what we're calling the addition rule where we are going to now relax the condition that the two events uh, should be mutually exclusive. So now in a more general case, the events are not necessarily uh, uh, mutually ex exclusive, meaning that the intersection of the two sets is not necessarily, is not necessarily an empty set. So uh, to generalize that third axiom, we say that, uh, we say that the, the rule that is axiom three can be generalized as follows. Can be generalized as follows. Eh? So if you generalize that statement, you get this. Eh? Probability of A union B is equal to probability of A plus probability of B. That's where the rule was stopping. But now you take away probability of A in the section B. You take away the probability of A in the section B. Okay. So in the in the case that we were discussing up there, we were letting this guy here to go to zero. We were letting this to the probability of A in the section B to go to zero because the intersection was an empty set. Okay. But this time around now we let it remain like that. Okay. So it can either be an empty set or not an empty set. So let's have uh, some illustration. Let's have some illustration. So let's consider the, the experiment of rolling a die once. 
And then from the sample space, we define set A as a set containing these two elements and set B as a set containing these two other elements. So in this case, we note that, so here we note that the intersection of A and B is not an empty set, it's a set that contains the single element, that one. So thus, if you take probability of A union B, it is the same as probability of A plus probability of B, but you take away probability of the intersection. We're taking away because if you look at this experiment, if you look at this Venn diagram here, if you look at this Venn diagram here, and we are considering events which are not mutually exclusive like this one, A and B, this is your universal set. If you, if you are talking about the union of these two sets, so this is set A or set B. Let's, go, let's look at set B. Set B is this part here. Set B is that. So that's what I've shared is what you call the union. But you notice that this part here has been counted twice. This part has been counted twice. So to make sure that we don't count any part twice, that's why we take away the intersection. That's why we take away the intersection. So that's where the formula, that's the logic behind the formula that we're talking about here. So if you were to, if you were to illustrate this, you would say that uh, if you were to find the probabilities of A union B, so let's see, probability of A, let's start with uh, the union. Huh? If you talk about A, union B is one, two, and three, okay? And the probabilities, if you are to find the probability of A union B is the number of elements in the union, which is three, divided by the number of elements in the sample space, which is six, okay? Now, using the right-hand side, probability of A, probability of A is uh, two out of, six because there are two elements in set a then probability of b is there are again two elements in in set b out of four then now if you take uh, the intersection of a and b probability of a intersection b how many elements are in the intersection only one element out of six and you notice that if you take probability of a plus probability of b minus probability of a in the section B is the same as two out of six plus two out of six minus one out of six, which is three out of six, which is the same as what we've got up here. Same. So if you stopped here, if you take probability of A plus probability of B, you find that you have counted the, 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 the intersection twice here. And that, that means that your probability will be inflated. So basically this is the rule that we prefer than axiom number three. So we prefer this rule than axiom number three because if it happens that the intersection has no elements, then we'll just be taking away zero. We'll just be taking away zero, okay? So let's have uh, some, some, some other example. So let's look at uh, this example, a contestant on a game on a game show is asked two questions. The probability that she gets the first question correct is 0.3, and the probability that she gets the second question correct is 0.4. Given that the probability of getting both questions correctly is 0.1, calculate the following probabilities. Uh, number one is that she gets either the first or the second or both questions correctly. And finally, the probability that she gets both questions wrong. Okay. So uh, let's use a Venn diagram to illustrate this. Huh? So let's solve this question using a Venn diagram. And uh, we can start by drawing the, the sample space using that rectangle. Then we can have the, the two events, that is uh, question one and question two. Okay, then now we can fill in the the probabilities uh, in the in the segments here. So if you talk, if you look at if you look at this point here. So.
So this space here represents the probability of getting the two questions correctly. You get both questions correctly. So this here represents the probability of getting question one correct only, only question one correct, okay? So this is question two. Eh? And then here we have the probability of getting question one, only question one correct. Then finally here outside the circles, we have the probability of getting both questions wrong because it's the complement of the union. All right. So uh, from the information given is that um, the probability of getting both questions correctly is 0 0.1. So this is where your 0 0.1 will come, 0 0.1. Then the entire probability of getting question one correctly, this section here is 0 0.3, meaning that out here we have 0 0.2. Then going to question two, the probability of getting question two correctly is 0 0.4. That means the entire of this circle has a probability of 0 0.4, meaning that uh, the probability outside the intersection here will be 0 0.3. Sometimes you can use very simple equations to solve, uh, to find out the probabilities. For instance, you can have the two circles like that. So you can say this is A, this is B, this is C. Okay, this is question one, you can call it A or set B like that. So when you talk about the probability of getting question one correctly, we talk about A plus B is equal to 0 0.4. Then the probability of getting question two correctly is the second, this is circle B, so that is B plus C is, uh, sorry, this is 0 0.3. Yeah? The first question is 0 0.3, question one is 0 0.3, A plus B. Then question two is, B plus C, which is 0 0.4. Then we also told that the probability of getting both, which is B, is 0 0.1. So you can solve these equations quite easily because uh, if you solve going upwards, this means that uh, C is 0 0.3. And then uh, also going upwards, it means that uh, A is 0 0.2, is similar to what we have here. So once you have a Venn diagram like this, we, you can answer all the questions, okay? So the probability that she gets either the first one or the second or both questions correctly is the area covered by the circles. That's the area we're talking about. Either A correctly or B correctly or both questions. And you find that the total area is 0 0.6. So the answer here is so the answer here is uh, 0 0.2 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.3 is 0 0.6. So the probability that she doesn't get any of the questions correctly is the area outside here. So you can even say here D. So you can just say there D. And here you come and say A plus B plus C plus D is one. Total area, I mean total probability must always be equal to one because this is like the probability of S is equal to one. So once you get the values of A, you get the value of B, you get the value of C, then D will be one minus the total of uh, those other probabilities, which is 0 0.4. That's the answer to the second question here. That's the answer to the second question, okay? Then, uh, so that's when you have two, when you have two events, that's how you can find the probability of the union. You can generalize uh, this into more than two events. You can generalize this a formula, the formula that we're talking about here, the general addition rule. You can generalize this formula to more than two events and you'll end up with a formula like the, the one shown below. So this is, uh, if you generalize the addition rule to three events, this is what we end up with. Huh? For a bit of A union B union C is equal to for a bit of A plus for a bit of B plus for a bit of C minus this intersection minus this other intersection minus yet another intersection plus this that intersection. You can uh, try to prove that uh, using a Venn diagram like this. Uh, if you have a Venn diagram like this, uh, where inside we have three events. If we say this is uh, A, B, and C, then you have letters here, A, C, B, E, F, G, yeah? Okay, so 
uh, you can show that the shaded part, the shaded part here, what we are calling the union of the three sets. So the shaded part is what we are calling, calling A union B union C. It is easy to show that uh, using a Venn diagram. Okay. So now I want us to move to what you call conditional probabilities. Conditional probabilities. So when you talk about conditional probabilities, we say that uh, if we have two events, A and B, the probability of A occurring, given that event B has already occurred, is what we are calling conditional probability. For instance, you can think about a scenario like the probability of there being traffic jam in town if it has already rained, okay? Or the probability of there being traffic jam on a busy highway if it is during peak hours. Those are what you call conditional probabilities. And if you want to say the probability of event A occurring, if or given the condition that B has already occurred, you denote it like this. So this is read as probability of A given that. So this vertical line here is the one that represents given that, the condition. Huh? So that uh, gives the condition. Given that the other event, that is B, has already occurred. Or you can simply say the probability of A given B. Okay. So you notice that in this context, a and B are dependent events. So A is dependent. In this case, A is dependent of event B. Okay. Then the conditional probability of A occurring given that B has already occurred is defined as follows. So the definition is given as is uh, mathematically is equal to the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. And you notice that the divisor here, the probability of B, B can happen when A has occurred. I mean, B and A can occur concurrently or B can happen alone. So it means that this can also be written as probability of A in the section B is the same as probability of A in the section B. So both two, both two occurring, eh? or the two events, sorry, both, uh, both A and B occurring or you can have just B occurring alone. So that probability of A not occurring, but B occurring. So that's the, 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 the divisor there. So B can occur and then A follows to occur. Or B can occur, then you find that A does not occur. So that's what comprises of the probability of B there. Okay. So let's have an example. So this is what you call the definition, the, the formula for the conditional probabilities. Okay, and this is the detailed one. They mean the same thing, this is a detailed one. So let's have an example to illustrate that. So the example says, um, in a group of 24 accountants, 20 have worked for company A and 12 have worked for company B. And you're told that everyone in the group has worked for at least one of the two companies. So this phrase here, at least one of the, at least one of the two companies means they have either worked for one of them, or two of them, or they have worked for both companies. So this is another way of saying the union uh, of the two sets. At least one of the two means that, or at least one of them means uh, we are working within the union of the two of the two sets or subsets. And the question is find uh, the probability that someone has worked for company A and company B. So this is like an intersection. And in the second question, you find the probability that someone has worked for company A, if it is known that the person has already worked for company B. So that's a conditional uh, probability. So let's define A as the event that an accountant has worked for company A. And then we say that B is the event that uh, an accountant has worked for company B. So uh, once we let A and B to be those events, we can continue to say that uh, the probability of A from the information given, we are, told, we are told 20, so 20 out of 24. Then we also know that probability of someone having worked for company B 
is 12 out of 24. Finally, we are told the probability of someone having worked for company A or for B or both. We're saying this is the same as saying probability of A union B. So if everyone has worked for at least one of the companies, it means that the union gives us the universal set. It means that the union of the two sets gives us the universal set. So it, it is something that looks like this. If you use a Venn diagram, would have, that is a, if that's the universal set, possibly you'll have, this is the first subset. So this is someone who has worked for company A, this is someone who has worked for company B. Such a way that if you find the union of those two sets, you will get the universal set. Okay, so uh, question number one, question number one, Question number one, we are being asked to find someone who has worked for both companies. Someone who has worked for both. This is the same as uh, that someone has worked for A and B. Is the intersection. Someone that has worked for both A and B. That's the intersection. And uh, how do you get the intersection? We know, we know from the addition rule, we know that probability of A union B is the same as probability of A plus probability of B minus probability of A in the section B. And this is what we are looking for, this guy here. Okay, so let's substitute what we already have. So this is the same as one, the probability there is one, probability of A, this is 20 out of 24, plus probability of B, this is 12 out of 24, minus probability of a in the section B. So we notice that the probability of A in the section B is the same as 1 minus 20 out of 24 minus uh, um, 20. Ah, sorry, this is a, this is a plus. Huh? It's the same as a, it's the same as 20 out of 24 plus 12 out of 24 minus a one. Looks like that, eh? because you take this guy, that side becomes a, a minus. You take this one here, it becomes a positive. So this is the same as uh, that two out of 24 minus 24 out of 24, which gives us um, eight out of 24. So that's the answer to the first question. The probability that someone has worked for both companies is eight out of 24. Okay. Then uh, Roman two, we talk about the probability that probability that uh, someone has worked for company A, given that if we know that they have already worked for company B, if we know that somebody has already worked for company B, so this is the same as probability of A and B, that is what we have just obtained in Roman one, divided by the probability that someone has worked for company B. So here we don't need the, the general addition. Huh? So here we just need this probability that someone has worked for company B because that probability is available. So this is equal to eight out of 24. That's the numerator divided by the divisor is 12 out of 24 from the information given. When you simplify that, you get two over three, two thirds. Okay. So that's how you apply the conditional rule of probability. So next we are looking at uh, the multiplication rule and what we have just concluded or what we mentioned a little bit earlier is the, is the addition rule. And the addition rule was basically revolving around the union of two or more sets. Now, when we come to the multiplication rule, uh, the attention now will be switching to the intersection of two or more sets. And we start by saying that if you, you rearrange the formula of conditional probabilities, uh, you obtain, or we obtain, we obtain probability of A in the section B, that is the same as A and B, as equal to probability of B multiplied by, uh, that's not necessary, multiply this by probability of A, given that B has already occurred. So what we're saying simply is that if you are given A given B, the, from the definition, this is the same as A and B divided by the probability of B. 
So if I multiply both sides by probability of B, multiply this by probability of B, you will end up with probability of B multiplied by probability of A, given that B has occurred, is the intersection. That's what we're talking about here. Okay. So this expression here, so this gives the probability of both A and B occurring. Both A and B occurring. So the multiplication rule gives us the probability of both A and B occurring. Okay. Now the, that rule gives rise to some other important concepts. So like the concept of independence, uh, which I want us to define also. So let's define what we call independent events. So when you talk about independent events, this is the opposite of what we called initially dependent events. Like when you look at uh, the definition of conditional probabilities, I mean, uh, conditional probabilities, we were referring to, to events which are dependent on one another, such a way that when one occurs, it affects the occurrence of the other one. But here, when we talk about uh, independent events, we, we say that uh, two events are said to be independent if the occurrence or an occurrence of one does not in any way affect the occurrence or an occurrence of the other one. Okay, that's what we call uh, independence. So, uh, e.g., if A and B are, oh, sorry, we say that, uh, that we say that A and B are said to be independent if they are said to be independent if, so we've said that uh, A and B are said to be independent if the probability of A is equal to the probability of A given that B has already occurred. So the fact that B has already occurred, we're saying here, does not affect A. And it's also the same as probability of A given that B has not occurred. So that means that the occurrence or non-occurrence of event B does not in any way affect the probability of a occurring. That's what we call independence. And we can say using uh, the definition of conditional probabilities that we saw earlier that probability of A given that B is equal to probability of A in the section B divided by probability of A uh, divided by probability of B. Using that, we can say that then if A and B are independent. If A and B are independent, then, then the probability of A and B occurring is the same as probability of A times probability of B. So if A and B are independent, then the probability of A and B occurring is the same as probability of uh, a occurring times the probability of B occurring. Okay. So uh, where does this come from? Because we know that uh, uh, from this statement here, we can end up with the probability of uh, A in the section B is the same as probability of B. I'm multiplying both sides by probability of B. Multiply this by probability of A given B. Okay. So we're saying that A and B are independent. So if A and B are independent, it means that we can replace this. This one is not in any way affected by the occurrence of B. So this is the same as probability of, A, uh, probability of B multiplied by, this is the same as probability of A. So probability of A and B. So if two events are independent, then the probability of both occurring is given by the product of the two individual probabilities. If two events are independent, then the probability of both occurring is given by the product of the two individual probabilities. Let's have an example to illustrate that. So let's consider the experiment of rolling a die twice, or maybe rolling two dice, and then 
we, we, we try to calculate the probability of rolling are five in both cases. So it's good to note that the two rolls are clearly independent events. They are clearly independent uh, experiments. Huh? So we can define our event A as the event of rolling a five in the first trial and B as the event of rolling a five in the second trial. Then since both events are independent, since both events are independent, we say that the probability of getting A and B, that is observing a five in the first case, and then you observe a five in the second case, is the same as probability of getting a five in the first case times the probability of getting a five in the other case like that. Okay, so the probability of getting a five in the first experiment is uh, the same as, uh, so this probability of A here, there's only one five out of six possible outcomes. And in the second scenario, there's only again one five out of the six scenarios. So this is the same as one out of six times one out of six, the same as one out of at six. So the probability of getting a five and a five or a five in both cases is one out of that six. Then uh, finally still under probabilities, uh, I want us to look at what we call tree diagrams. And tree diagrams are just convenient ways of expressing uh, or representing probabilities. Uh, as we've mentioned earlier, probabilities may be represented using Venn diagrams. You can use tables like conjugacy tables, or you can now use what you're calling uh, tree diagrams. So as, as mentioned earlier, uh, tree diagrams are just convenient ways of representing probabilities. I want us to have this example. Uh, a box of chocolates contains eight milk chocolates and four plain chocolates. The chocoholic eats three chocolates selected at random from the box. Calculate the probability that all are milk chocolates huh? or exactly one is a milk chocolate. And we are asked to use a tree diagram to represent this scenario. So, uh, the first choice solution, the first choice of chocolate, this is our first choice, will either give you a milk chocolate, we're using M for milk chocolate or the plain chocolate, okay? If this is the case, then using the classical definition of probability, the probability of uh, choosing a milk chocolate is the number of milk chocolates in the box, which is eight out of the number of uh, chocolates in the box, which is 12. And on the other side, the probability of choosing a plain chocolate will be four out of 12. And this is now where the conditions come in. Eh? So if the first chocolate was milk, then there are two possibilities in the second choice. Eh? So this is our second choice. Eh? You can either get a milk or plain, or you can also be here. If the first one was plain, you can end up choosing either milk or plain. Then we can compute the probabilities. If the first, choice was milk chocolate, huh? then you know that now the number of milk chocolates have reduced by one. So we're going to have seven milk chocolates and in total, the box has 11 chocolates. If the first box, if the first choice was milk, then we know that the number of plain chocolates has not reduced. So there are still four out of 11. If you check the probabilities on every branch, you will see that they are giving you to one. Even this one, if you add these two probabilities, you'll always get one. Same case here. If the first one was plain chocolate, then the number of milk chocolates have not reduced. So there are still eight out of, in total we have 11 chocolates remaining. And if the first chocolate was plain, then as you choose the second one, the number of plain chocolates have reduced to three and in total we have 11. So that means if you take this plus this, you'll get one. In the third choice, you still have the two possibilities, milk, plain. Same case here, milk, plain. Same case here, milk, plain. Even here, milk and plain. So the probabilities uh, will be here, we'll have six out of, now we have 10. So this is four out of, four out of 10. Then this is milk. 
So this is the, so we still have seven out of 10 and then plane, how many are remaining? Three out of 10. Then uh, uh, in this scenario, we have seven out of 10. And then here we have three out of 10. And finally here, we still have all the eight out of 10. And here we have two out of 10. Then what are the possible events? Uh, the possible events are M, M, M. You can get three milk chocolates. And actually that's our first question. You can get M, M, P, or you can get M, P, M, or you can get M, P, P, or you can get P, M, M, or you can get P, M, P, or you can get P, P, M, or finally you can get P, P, and P. So these events, all these events, they comprise what we call the sample space, all of them. They comprise what we call the sample space. Then you can get the probability of occurrence of each of these possible events and what we call the joint probabilities. Huh? The joint probabilities. So the probability of getting an M followed by an M followed by an M is the same as eight out of 12 times seven out of 12, sorry, times seven out of 11 times six out of 10. You take these probabilities, you multiply them. So you take this times that times that. That's the probability of getting three M's. And the second one will be eight out of 12 times uh, seven out of 11 times four out of 10. And this one uh, will be eight out of 12 times four out of 11 times seven out of 10. Okay. You do like that for all of them. So this will be four out of 12 times three out of 11 times two out of uh, two out of 10. If you sum these probabilities, you'll get one. And that actually confirms that if you take the probability of S, you'll, be, you'll get a total, you'll get is equal to one. So you can uh, complete this diagram later on. Huh? Then let's go to the questions. And the first question is the probability of getting three M's. Huh? And uh, that answer is already available from the tree diagram here. So it's a product of those probabilities. Then when we talk about probability of getting exactly one P, it's the same as exactly one P means uh, either this scenario or this scenario, whether it's exactly one P, this one P, this one P, this also one P, okay? So what you do, you add the three probability. You take this probability plus this probability plus the other probability. And you can confirm that the answer is 28 out of 55. There is a quick way, for instance, if you want to draw a tree diagram with four branches, or if you want to, let's say, to make four selections, it becomes, a tree diagram becomes quite cumbersome. Or if you want to select more than three, the tree diagram becomes very complicated. So in those scenarios, you can use your calculators using the function called combinations, using the function called combinations to do what we call subsetting uh, to obtain the, the required subset. And a subset here is like a, an event, then you compute the probabilities without having to draw the tree diagrams. I want to show you how to quickly do that using the combinations function of your calculators. Yeah, sorry, there's uh, this correction and we have corrected that uh, Romantu should read exactly one is a plain chocolate. He had written milk chocolate. Huh? So there's that correction. And also, so, but these, the, the highlighted points here are the correct ones. Huh? And then there was also this part here. This is supposed to be MPM. I think initially there was something else. So MPM, we are talking about a scenario where there's only one P, a scenario where there's only one P. But the answer remains. So I want to show you how to use your calculators using the combinations key. So uh, we're talking about the use of combinations or the combination function in your calculators to uh, to solve some of these problems 
quite fast huh? without having to draw a tree diagram with very many branches. Huh? So we use the function uh, NCR on your calculators huh? where this is called the combinations function. And the combinations function gives us the number of ways of choosing R objects from a group of N objects where R is always less or equal to N. And as we did earlier on, EJ three combination two is equal to three, uh, three ways. Huh? So this uh, means that if you have uh, a group of three elements, like three individuals, and you want to choose, so this is like your N is equal to three, and you want to choose two of them, then there are three ways of choosing uh, two elements or two individuals from a group of three. That means you can choose A and B, you can choose A and C, you can choose B and C. So those are the three ways, okay? So for simple problems like this, you can even do it without having to use your calculator. But when the number increases, uh, you find that it is not possible for you to, uh, to do it by hand, like the way we have done it here. So let's go back to our question. We are talking about Roman one was the probability of getting uh, all milk uh, chocolate. Huh? That means out of all the milk chocolates, which are eight, you choose three in three trials. So this is given by uh, the number of ways of choosing. This is given by the number of ways of choosing three milk chocolates from eight milk chocolates multiplied by, if you are choosing three milk chocolates in three trials, it also means that you're going to choose zero plain chocolates out of the four. So you take that, multiply by number of ways of choosing zero plain chocolates from four plain chocolates. So you take those two, you multiply. Then what do you do with the product? You divide that by number of ways, number of ways of choosing three chocolates out of 12 chocolates, out of eight plus four, which is 12 chocolates. So when you press that, you will get the answer that we got. The answer that we got, which is uh, uh, 14 out of 55. So in symbols, the probability of getting MMM is the same as from eight, you choose three, then from the four, you choose none of them. Then you divide that by, from the 12, you choose three. So that's what we have said here. You take the number of ways of choosing three milk chocolates from the eight, from the group of eight, multiply that by the number of ways of choosing, the number of ways of choosing no plain chocolates out of the four uh, chocolates divide that by the total number of ways of choosing three chocolates uh, out of 12 chocolates, where 12 is the total number, okay? So from your calculator, eight combination three, let's get these values, four combination zero, and then finally 12 combination three. So what is our eight combination three? 56. Six. Five, six. And then what is a uh, four combination zero? One. One. And then finally, what is 12 combination three? 220. 220. That means when you come here, we'll have 56. Times one divided by 20. Which gives us. Zero point. Yeah, 14 out of 55, huh? Yes. Yeah, uh, Roman two the no. same way. 
Roman two the same way, yeah. We talk about probability of exactly one plane. We are choosing three, but we're talking about probability of getting exactly one plane. So this is the same as the probability of getting one plane and two milk. When you talk about getting exactly one plane out of three, it means that the other two are milk chocolates. Huh? So this is the same as uh, from the eight milk chocolates, you choose two. And then from the plain chocolates, which are four, you choose one. Divide by, we always divide by, from the 12, you choose three. From the 12, you choose three. Okay. So what is our uh, eight combination two? 28. Two, eight. And then four combination one which is four. four. And then we always divide by, uh, in this case is uh, 220. And that's a quick way of solving that problem. So if you have many branches, don't draw a very big tree. Yeah? Just use the concept of subsetting using combination yeah? to get the answers quite fast like that. Okay. That is it. Uh, that's basically what I wanted us to cover about probabilities. Uh, I wonder in the next five minutes if you allow me to discuss the concept of expected value of a random variable. So when you talk about a random variable, we talk about a rule that associates uh, a number with each element in the sample space. We can have an example like this, e.g. if we consider the experiment of uh, tossing a fair coin twice, If we consider that experiment, then the sample space will be given by this HT, TH, or TT. That's our sample space. Then we can define a variable X. If we say let X be the number of heads, the number of heads in each outcome, in each possible outcome. Okay, so if you count the number of heads, this in this possible outcome, there are two heads. In this possible outcome, there's only one head. Here there's only one head. Here there is no head. So that means that what you are calling X, uh, the number of heads, so we say that uh, X takes the values zero, one, or two. So those are the possible numbers that X can take. So hence we say, hence, x is a random variable. Is a random variable. In this case, we say that x is a random variable, which gives us the number of heads in every possible outcome. So using the variable x, we can come up with a table like this, which has links every uh, possible value of x with the probability of occurrence. So we can have x here, which takes 0, 1, or 2 then assuming that this is a fair coin, yeah, it's a fair coin, then we can have the probability of occurrence of X, of every value of X. For instance, we can talk about the probability that X, that is the number of heads is equal to zero. Then coming to a sample space, that is only happening once out of four possible outcomes. So the probability there is one out of four. Then the probability that X is equal to one, that is the probability that we have exactly one head that is appearing twice out of four possible outcomes. Then finally, the probability that X takes the value two is only occurring once. And then if you take that sum, you'll always get one. So now we can claim that X is a random variable. X is a random variable. And this kind of table, we'll be discussing it later on in uh, statistics two, this is what we call a probability. This is an example of a, what you call a probability distribution of the random variable x. Now, when you talk about the expected value of a random variable, we talk about the mean. The expected value of a random variable is actually what we call the mean of that uh, random variable. 
actually the the concept of uh, uh, expected value is used in the context, context of probabilities whereas the concept of mean or arithmetic mean is used in the con in the context of uh, statistics so we can say that the expected value of a random variable uh, which is denoted by denoted by this e of x like that is defined as we define this as e of x is equal to you take the value of the first value of x multiplied by the corresponding probability plus all the other values of x multiplied by their corresponding probabilities up to the last one that kind of summation that summation of the product of x and the corresponding probabilities is what we're calling the expected value so we can compress this into summation of x multiplied by p that is sum of the product of x and p that's what we call the expected value and here we note that this definition is true this is definition here so x is a discrete random variable so if we have a continuous uh, random variable then the definition changes uh, because now we use the integration now so what we're calling the expected value is actually the mean so we can also define the variance or the standard deviation so we can say that the variance of a random variable x is the expected value is another way of saying it is the mean it is the expected value um, of squared deviations of squared deviations okay so we're saying that that is when you talk about variance variance of x is the expected value which is the same as the arithmetic mean of x minus mu those are deviations squared okay so where what i'm calling mu here is the expected value of x it is the mean it is equivalent to saying remember in the case of uh, descriptive statistics we said that uh, we can say that variance of x is given by you take sum of x minus x bar squared divided by n the summation of all square deviations divided by n is the same as saying is the mean of squared deviations and of course in this case the deviations are measured from x bar if you take the square root uh, sorry if you take the square root of variance of x you end up with the square root of this uh, you end up with what we call the standard deviation of x you end up with what we call the standard deviation of x so in this context when we talk about the expected value of x minus mu squared it means that you will you will have an object called or a variable called x minus mu squared you will have that then you find the expected value of this item here and you only need to multiply each value of this square deviation by the corresponding probability and then you end up with the variance of the variable x so let's have a quick example to illustrate that So let's refer to the illustration above where we have x taking the value 0, 1, or 2, and the probabilities are given here. So to start with, let's find the expected value of x. So to do that, we create a column here where we need to multiply x times p. So 0 times a quarter, you get 0. This times that, you get 2 over 4. And then this gives you 2 over 4. So the expected value of x is 0 plus 2 over 4 plus 2 over 4 what 1 so this is like the mean value this is what we are calling mean the expected value of x that is it about part 1 the second part when you want to find variance we need to get the deviations and you have them squared so we need x minus mu those are the deviations and you square them so we'll be taking every value of x minus 1 which, which is our mu then you square 
So this will be uh, zero minus one squared, which gives us a positive one. So all the values in this column will be in a negative. Then here we have, um, uh, this is a one minus one, which is zero squared gives us a zero. Then we have a two minus a one, which is one squared gives us a one. So we need to find the mean of this new column. We need to find the mean of this new column, the mean of these numbers. And we'll work with this as their probabilities. This would be their probabilities. So uh, coming here, we need to, to have uh, P multiplied by X minus mu squared. That's what will give us the items that once we sum, you get the, the variance or the mean. Huh? So if you take this value times the probability there, you'll get one over four. This times the probability there, you get a zero. And then uh, this times the probability, you get one over four there. So if you sum this, if you sum P multiplied by X minus mu squared, this is what you're calling the variance of X. So in this case, the variance of X will be equal to one over four plus one over four, which is equal to one over two. So that means if you want standard deviation of X, the square root of one over two, okay? So that marks the end of today's class. Uh, and we've covered what we needed to cover in this class. Any questions?